bodiless consciousness. The bases of this yoga are of a highly metaphysical and scientific character. For its understanding, there is required a full acquaintance with Indian philosophy, religious doctrine and ritual in general, and in particular with that presentment of these three matters which is given in the Shakta and monistic or Advaita Shaiva Tantras. It would need more than a bulky volume to describe and explain in any detail the nature and meaning of this yoga and the basis on which it rests. I must therefore assume in the reader either this general knowledge or a desire to acquire it and confine myself to such an exposition of general principles and leading facts as will supply the key by which the doors leading to a theoretical knowledge of the subject may be open by those desirous of passing through and beyond them and as will thus facilitate the understanding of the difficult texts here translated for, on the practical side, I can merely reproduce the directions given in the books, together with such explanations of them as I have received orally. Those who wish to go further and to put into actual process this yoga must first satisfy themselves of the value and suitability of this yoga and then learn directly of a guru who has himself been through it, or Siddha. His experience alone will say whether the aspirant is capable of success. It is said that of those who attempt it, one out of a thousand may have success. If the latter enters upon the path, the Guru alone can save him from attendant risks, moulding and guiding the practice as he will, according to the particular capacities and needs of his disciple. Whilst, therefore, on this heading, it is possible to explain some general principles, their application is dependent on the circumstances of each particular case. The ultimate or irreducible reality is spirit, in the sense of pure consciousness, which is chit or samvit, from out of which, and by its power or shakti, mind and matter proceed. Spirit is one. There are no degrees or differences in spirit. The spirit which is in man is the one spirit which is in everything and which as the object of worship is the Lord or Ishwara or God. Mind and matter are many and of many degrees and qualities. Atma or spirit as such is the whole Purna without section, akanda. Mind and matter are parts in that whole. They are not the whole and are the section. Spirit is infinite and formless. Mind and matter are finite and with form. Atma is unchanged and inactive. Its power is active and changes in the form of mind and matter. Pure consciousness is chit or samvit. Matter as such is the unconscious. And mind too is unconscious according to the Vedanta. For all that is not the conscious self is the unconscious object. This does not mean that it is unconscious in itself. On the contrary, 
all is essentially consciousness, but that it is unconscious because it is the object of the conscious self. For mind limits consciousness so as to enable man to have finite experience. There is no mind without consciousness as its background, though supreme consciousness is mindless. Where there is no mind, there is no limitation. Consciousness remains in one aspect unchanged, changes in its other aspect as active power, which manifests as body and mind. Man then is pure consciousness or chit, vehicled by its power as mind and body. In theology, this pure consciousness is Shiva and his power Shakti, who as she is in her formless self, is one with him. She is the great Devi, the mother of the universe, who as the life force resides in man's body in its lowest center at the base of the spine, just as Shiva is realized in the highest brain center, the cerebrum or Sahasrara Padma. Completed yoga is the union of her and him in the body of the sadhaka. This is laya or dissolution, the reverse of shristi or involution of spirit in mind and matter. Some worship predominantly the masculine or right side of the conjoint male and female figure. Some the Shaktas predominantly worship the left and call her mother, for she is the great mother, the Mahadevi, who conceives, bears, and nourishes the universe sprung from her womb. This is so because she is the active aspect of consciousness, imagining the world to be according to the impressions or samskara derived from enjoyment and suffering in former worlds. It is held natural to worship her as mother. The first mantra into which all men are initiated is the word ma or mother. It is their first word and generally their last. The father is a mere helper of the mother. The whole world of the five elements also springs from the active consciousness or Shakti and is her manifestation. Therefore, men worship the mother than whom is none more tender, saluting her smiling beauty as the rosy Tripura Sundari, the source of the universe, and her awe-inspiring grandeur as Kali, who takes it back into herself. Here we are concerned with yoga, which is the realization of the union of the mother and lord aspects in that state of consciousness which is the absolute. Veda says, all this, that is, the manifold world, is the one Brahman. How the many can be the one is variously explained by the different schools. The interpretation here given is that contained in the Shakta Tantras or Agamas. In the first place, what is the one reality which appears as many? What is the nature of Brahman as it is in itself? The answer is Shat Chit Ananda, that is, being, consciousness, bliss. 
Consciousness or feeling as such, chit or samvit, is identical with being as such. Though in the ordinary experience the two are essentially bound up together, they still diverge or seem to diverge from each other. Man, by his constitution, inadvertently believes in an object existence beyond and independent of himself. And there is such objectivity as long as being embodied spirit or jiva atma, his consciousness is veiled or contracted by maya. But in the ultimate basis of experience, which is the supreme spirit, of Paramatma, the divergence is gone, for in it lie in undifferentiated mass experiencer, experience, and the experienced. When, however, we speak of Chit as feeling consciousness, we must remember that what we know and observe as such is only a limited changing manifestation of chit, which is in itself the infinite changeless principle, which is the background of all experience. This being consciousness is absolute bliss, which is defined as resting in the self. It is bliss because, being the infinite all, it can be in want of nothing. This blissful consciousness is the ultimate or irreducible nature of Swarupa, or own form of the one reality, which is both the whole as the irreducible real and part as the reducible real. Swarupa is the nature of anything as it is in itself as distinguished from what it may appear to be. Supreme Consciousness is the Supreme Shiva Shakti, which never changes, but eternally endures the same throughout all change, effected in its creative aspect as Shiva Shakti. All manifestation is associated with apparent unconsciousness. The mind is evidently not a pure, but a limited consciousness. What limits it must be something either in itself unconscious or, if conscious, capable of producing the appearance of consciousness. In the phenomenal world, there is nothing absolutely conscious nor absolutely unconscious. Consciousness and unconsciousness are always intermingled. Some things, however, appear to be more conscious and some more unconscious than others. This is due to the fact that chit, which is never absent in anything, yet manifests itself in various ways and degrees. The degree of this manifestation is determined by the nature and development of the mind and body in which it is enshrined. Spirit remains the same. The mind and body change. The manifestation of consciousness is more or less limited as ascent is made from mineral to man. In the mineral world, chit manifests as the lowest form of sentiency, evidenced by reflex response to stimuli. And that physical consciousness, which is called in the West, atomic memory. The sentiency of plants is more developed Though it is, as Chakrapani says in the Bhanumati, a dormant consciousness. This is further manifested in those microorganisms which are intermediate stages between the vegetable and animal worlds, 
and have a psychic life of their own. In the animal world, consciousness becomes more centralized and complex, reaching its fullest development in man, who possesses all the psychic functions such as cognition, perception, feeling and will. Behind all these particular changing forms of sentiency or consciousness is the one formless, changeless chit, as it is in itself, Swarupa, that is, as distinguished from the particular forms of its manifestation. As chit throughout all these stages of life remains the same, it is not in itself really developed. The appearance of development is due to the fact that it is now more and now less veiled or contracted by mind and matter. It is this veiling by the power of consciousness or Shakti which creates the world. What is it then which veils consciousness and thus produces world experience? The answer is power or Shakti as Maya. Maya Shakti is that which seemingly makes the whole Purna into the not hold or Apurna, the infinite into the finite the formless into forms and the like. It is a power which thus cuts down, veils and negates. Negates what? Perfect consciousness. Is Shakti in itself the same as or different from Shiva or Chit? It must be the same for otherwise all could not be one Brahman. But if it is the same, it must also be Chit or Consciousness. Therefore it is such Chidanandamai or Chidrupini. And yet there is, at least in appearance, some distinction. Shakti which comes from the root Shak, to have power, to be able means power. As she is one with Shiva, as power holder or Shaktiman, she as such power is the power of Shiva or consciousness. There is no difference between Shiva as the possessor of power or Shaktiman and power as it is in itself. The power of consciousness is consciousness in its active aspect. Whilst, therefore, both Shiva and Shakti are consciousness, the former is the changeless, static aspect of consciousness, and Shakti is the kinetic aspect of the same consciousness. The particular power whereby the dualistic world is brought into being is Maya Shakti, which is both availing and projecting Shakti. Consciousness veils itself to itself and projects from the store of its previous experiences the notion of a world is which it suffers and enjoys. The universe is thus the creative imagination, or Shristi Kalpana as it is called, of the supreme world thinker, or Ishwara. Maya is that power by which things are measured, that is, formed and made known. It is the sense of difference or that which makes man see the world and all things and persons therein as different from himself, when in essence he and they are the one self. It is that which establishes a dichotomy in what would otherwise be a unitary experience 
and is the cause of the dualism inherent in all phenomenal experience. Shakti as action veils consciousness by negating in various degrees herself as consciousness. Before the manifestation of the universe, infinite being, consciousness, bliss alone was. That is, Shiva Shakti as Chit and Chidrupini respectively. This is the experience whole or Purna, in which, as the Upanishad says, the self knows and loves the self. It is this love which is bliss or resting in the self. For as it is elsewhere said, Supreme love is bliss. This is Parashiva, who in the scheme of the 36 tattvas is known as Parasamavit. This monism posits a dual aspect of the single consciousness, one the transcendental changeless aspect which is Parasamavit and the other, the creative, changing aspect, which is called Shiva Shakti Tattva. In Parasamvit, the I, or Aham, and the This, or Idam, or universe objects, are indistinguishably mingled in the supreme unitary experience. In Shiva Shakti Tattva, Shakti, which is the negative aspect of the former, her function being negation, negates herself as the object of experience, leaving the Shiva consciousness as a mere I, not looking towards another. This is a state of mere subjective illumination to which Shakti, who is called Vimarsha again presents herself, but now with a distinction of I and this, as yet held together as part of one self. At this point, the first incipient stage of dualism, there is the first transformation of consciousness known as Sadashiva or Sadhakya Tattva which is followed by the second, or Ishwara Tattva, and then by the third, or Shuddha Vidya Tattva. In the first, emphasis is laid on the this, in the second, on the I, and in the third, on both equally. Then Maya severs the united consciousness, so that the object is seen as other than the self and then as split up into the multitudes objects of the universe. In the mantra side of the Tantra Shastra, dealing with mantra and its origin, these two tattvas emanating from Shakti are from the sound side known as Nada and Bindu. Parashiva and Parashakti are motionless or ni spanda and soundless or ni shabda. Nada is the first produced movement in the ideating cosmic consciousness leading up to the sound Brahman or shabda Brahman, whence all ideas, the language in which they are expressed or shabda, and the objects, or artha, which they denote, are derived. Bindu literally means a point and a dot, or anusvara, which denotes in Sanskrit the nasal breathing. It is placed in the Chandra Bindu nasal breathing above Nada. In a technical mantra sense, it denotes that state of active consciousness or shakti 
in which the I or illuminating aspect of consciousness identifies itself with the total this. It subjectifies the this thereby becoming a point or bindu of consciousness with it. When consciousness apprehends an object as different from itself, it sees that object as extended in space. But when that object is completely subjectified, it is experienced as an unextended point. This is the universe experience of the Lord Experiencer as Bindu. Where does the universe go at dissolution? It is withdrawn into that Shakti which projected it. It collapses, so to speak, into a mathematical point without any magnitude whatever. This is the Shiva Bindu which again is withdrawn into the Shiva Shakti Tattva, which produced it. It is conceived that round the Shiva Bindu, there is coiled Shakti, just as in the earth center called Muladhara Chakra in the human body, a serpent clings round the self-produced phallus. This coiled Shakti may be conceived as a mathematical line, also without magnitude, which, being everywhere in contact with the point round which it is coiled, is compressed together with it, and forms therefore also one and the same point. There is one indivisible unity of dual aspect, which is figured also in the Tantras as a grain of gram which has two seeds so closely joined as to look as one surrounded by an outer sheath. To revert to the former simile, the Shakti coiled round Shiva making one point or bindu with it is Kundalini Shakti. This word comes from the word Kundala or coil or bangle she is spoken of as coiled because she is likened to a serpent which is when resting and sleeping lies coiled and because the nature of her power is spiral it manifests itself as such in the worlds the spheroids or eggs of brahma and in their circular or revolving orbits and in other ways Thus the Tantras speak of the development of the straight line from the point which, when it is gone, its length as a point is turned by the force of the spiral sack of Maya in which it works so as to form a figure of two dimensions, which again is turned upon itself, ascending as a straight line into the plane of the third dimension thus forming a triangular or pyramid figure called Shringataka. In other words, this Kundalini Shakti is that which when it moves to manifest itself, appears at the universe. To say that it is coiled is to say that it is at rest, that is, in the form of a static potential energy. This Shakti coiled round the Supreme Shiva is called Maha Kundalini, or the Great Coiled Power, to distinguish it from the same power which exists in individual bodies, which is called Kundalini. It is with and through the last power that this yoga is effected. When it is accomplished, the individual Shakti or Kundalini is united with the great cosmic Shakti or Maha Kundalini and she with Shiva with whom she is essentially one. Kundalini is an aspect of the eternal Brahman and is both attributeless and with attribute. 
in her nirguna aspect she is pure consciousness and bliss itself as saguna she is by whose power all creatures are displayed kundalini shakti in individual bodies its power at rest or the static center round which every form of existence as moving power revolves in the universe there is always in and behind every form of activity a static background the one consciousness is polarized into static or shiva and kinetic or shakti aspects for the purpose of creation this yoga is the resolution of this duality into unity again the indian scriptures say in the words of herbert spencer in his first principles that the universe is an unfoldment or shrishti from the homogeneous or mula prakriti to the heterogeneous or vikriti and back to the homogeneous again which is pralaya or dissolution there are thus alternate states of evolution and dissolution manifestation taking place after a period of rest so also professor huxley in his evolution and ethics speaks of the manifestation of cosmic energy alternating between phases of potentiality which is pralaya and phases of explication or shrishti it may be he says as kant suggests every cosmic magma predestined to evolve into a new world has been the no less predestined end of a vanished predecessor this the indian shastra affirms in its doctrine that there is no such thing as an absolutely first creation the present universe being but one of a series of worlds which are past and yet are to be at the time of dissolution or pralaya there is consciousness as maha kundalini though undistinguishable from its general mass the potentiality or seed of the universe to be maya as the world potentially exists as maha kundalini who is herself one with consciousness or shiva this maya contains and is in fact constituted by the collective samskara or vasana that is the mental impressions and tendencies produced by karma accomplished in previously existing worlds these constitute the mass of potential ignorance that is avidya by which consciousness veils itself they were produced by desire for worldly enjoyment and themselves produce such desire the worlds exist because they in their totality will to exist each individual exists because his will desires worldly life this seed is therefore the collective or cosmic will towards manifested life that is the life of form and enjoyment at the end of the period of rest which is dissolution this seed ripens in consciousness consciousness has thus a twin aspect its liberation or mukti or formless aspect in which it is a, as mere consciousness bliss and a universe or form aspect in which it becomes the world of enjoyment that is bhukti one of the cardinal principles of the shakta tantra is to secure by its sadhana both liberation or mukti and enjoyment or bhukti this is possible by the identification of the self when in enjoyment 
with the soul of the world. When this seed ripens, Shiva is said to put forth his Shakti. As this Shakti is himself, it is he in his Shiva Shakti aspect who comes forth, or Prasarati, and endows himself with all the forms of worldly life. In the pure, perfect, formless consciousness, there springs up the desire to manifest in the world of forms, the desire for enjoyment of and as form. This takes place as a limited stress in the ultimated, unmoving surface of pure consciousness, which is Nishkala Shiva, but without affecting the latter. There is thus change in the changelessness and changelessness in change. Shiva in his transcendent aspect does not change, but Shiva in his imminent aspect as Shakti does. As creative will arises, Shakti thrills as Nada and assumes the form of Bindu which is Ishwara Tattva, whence all the worlds derive. It is for their creation that Kundalini uncoils. When karma ripens, the Devi in the words of the Nigama becomes desirous of creation and covers herself with her own Maya. Again, the Devi joyful in the mad delight of her union with the supreme Akula becomes Vikarini, that is, the Vikras of, or Tattvas of mind and matter which constitute the universe appear. The Shastras have dealt with the stages of creation in great detail, both from the subjective and objective viewpoints as changes in the limited consciousness or as movement, form and sound. Both the Shevas and Shaktas equally accept the 36 categories or Tattvas, the Kalas, the Shaktis Unmani and the rest in the Tattvas, the Shadhava, the mantra concepts of Nada, Bindu, Kamakala, and so forth. Authors of the Northern Shaiva school, of which a leading Shastra is the Malini Vijaya Tantra, have described with great profundity these tattvas. General conclusions only are, however, here summarized. These 36 tattvas are in the tantras divided into three groups called Atma, Vidya and Shiva Tattvas. The first group includes all the Tattvas from the lowest Prithvi, that is earth, to Prakriti, which are known as the impure categories or Ashuddha Tattva. The second includes Maya, the Kanchukas, and Purusha, called pure impure categories or Shuddha Ashuddha Tattva. And the third includes the, the five highest Tattvas called the pure Tattvas or Shuddha Tattva from Shiva Tattva to Shuddha Vidya. As already stated, the supreme changeless state or Parasamvit is the unitary experience in which the I and this coalesce in unity. In the kinetic or Shakti aspect, as presented by the pure categories, experience recognizes an I and this, but the latter is regarded not as something opposed to and outside the I, but as part of a one self which has two sides, an I and a this. The emphasis varies from insistence on the I 
to insistence on the this, and then to equality of emphasis on the I and this as a preparation for the dichotomy in consciousness which follows. The pure, impure categories are intermediate between the pure and the impure. The essential characteristic of experience constituted by the impure categories is its dualism affected through Maya and its limitations, the result of the operation of the Kanchukas. Here, the this is not seen as part of the self, but as opposed to and without it, and as an object seen outside. Each consciousness thus became mutually exclusive, the one or the other. The states thus described are threefold. A transcendental mingled I and this, in which these elements of experience are, as such, not evolved. And a pure form of experience intermediate between the first and last, in which both the I and the this are experienced as part of oneself. And thirdly, the state of manifestation proper, where there is a complete cleavage between the I and the this, in which an outer object is presented to the consciousness of a knower, which is other than the subject. This last stage is itself twofold. In the first, the Purusha experiences a homogeneous universe, though different from itself, as Prakriti. In the second, Prakriti is split up into its effects, or Vikriti, which are mind and matter, and the multiginous beings of the universe which they compose. Shakti as Prakriti first evolves mind, which is buddhi or ahamkara or manas, and senses, that is indriya, and then sensible matter, which is bhuta, of fivefold form, that is ether, air, fire, water and earth, derived from the supersensible generals of the sense particulars called tanmatra. When Shakti has entered the last and grossest tattva, that is earth, that is solid matter, there is nothing further for her to do. Her creative activity then ceases and she rests. She rests in her last emanation, the earth principle. She is again coiled and sleeps. She is now Kundalini Shakti, whose abode in the human body is the earth center or Muladhara Chakra. As in the supreme state, she lay coiled as the Maha Kundalini round the supreme Shiva, so here she coils around the Svayumbha Linga in the Muladhara. This is the last center or chakra and the four above it are centers of the five forms of matter. The sixth center is that of mind. Consciousness and its processes through Shakti prior to the appearance of Maya are realized in the seventh lotus which is the Sasrara Padma and the centers intermediate between it and the sixth or Agnya mind center. The mantra evolution, which must be known if the text is to be understood, is set forth with great clarity in the Sharada Tilaka, wherein it is said that the Sakala Shiva or Shiva Tattva, who is Sat Chit Ananda, issued Shakti or Shakti Tattva from the latter Nada, and from Nada evolved Bindu which is, to distinguish it from the Bindu which follows, is called the Supreme Bindu. Nada and Bindu are, like all else, aspects of power or Shakti, 
being those states of her which are the proper conditions for and in which she is prone to creation. In those tattvas, the germ of action, or Kriya Shakti, sprouts towards its full manifestation. The tantras, in so far as they are mantra shastras, are concerned with shabda, or sound, a term later explained. Mantra is manifested shabda. Nada, which is also literally means sound, is the first of the produced intermediate causal bodies of manifested shabda. Bindu, which has previously been explained, is described as the state of the letter Ma before manifesting, consisting of the Shiva Shakti Tattva enveloped by Maya or Parma Kundalini. It implies the void Shunya, that is, the Brahman state or Brahmapada, in the empty space within the circle of the Bindu as also the gunas which are implicitly contained in it since it is indissolvable union with shakti in whom the gunas or factors constituting the material source of all things are contained the para bindu is called the ganavasta or massive state of shakti it is chid ghana or massive consciousness that is chit associated with undifferentiated shakti in which lie potentially in a mass or ghana though undistinguishable the one from the other all the worlds and beings to be created this is parama shiva in whom there are all devatas it is this bindu who is the lord ishwara whom some Puranikas called Mahavishnu and others the Brahma Purusha. As the commentator says, it is not a matter of what he is called. He is the Lord or Ishwara who is worshipped in secret by all Devas and is pointed to in different phases of the Chandra Bindu or Nada Bindu, Shakti and Shanta of the Om and other Bija mantras. Its abode is Satyaloka, which within the human body exists in the precept of a thousand petaled lotus or Sahasrara in the highest cerebral center. The Sharada then says that the Parabindu, whose substance is supreme Shakti, divides itself into three that is, appears under a threefold aspect. There are thus three Bindus, the first of which is called Bindu, and the others Nada and Bija. Bindu is in the nature of Shiva and Bija of Shakti. Nada is Shiva Shakti that is, their mutual relation or interaction or, or yoga, as the Prayogasara calls it. The threefold bindu, that is three bindu, is supreme, para, subtle, sukshma, and gross, stula. Nada is thus the union of these two in creation. As the text says, it is by this division of Shiva and Shakti that there arises creative ideation. The causal Bindu is from the Shakti aspect, undifferentiated Shakti, with all powers, from the Prakriti aspect, three Gunamai, Mula Prakriti, from the Devata aspect, the, the unmanifest, and from the Devi aspect, Shanta. The three Bindus separately indicate the operations of the three powers of will, that's Ichicha, knowledge, Jnana, and action, Kriya. 
and the three gunas, rajas, sattva and tamas. Also the manifestation of the three devis, vama, jeshta, raudri, and the three devatas, brahma, vishnu, rudra, who spring from them. It is said in the Prayogasara and Sharada that Raudri issued from Bindu, Jeshta from Nada and Vama from Bija. From these came Rudra, Vishnu, Brahma, which are in the nature of Jnana, Kriya, Ichcha and Moon, Sun, Fire. The three Bindus are known as Sun, Ravi, Moon, Chandra and Fire, Agni terms constantly appearing in the works here translated. In sun there are fire and moon. It is known as Mishra Bindu, and in the form of such is not different from Paramshiva and is Kamakala. Kamakala is the triangle of divine desire formed by the three Bindus, that is, their collectivity this Kamakala is the root or mula of all mantra. Moon is Shiva Bindu and white. Fire is Shakti Bindu and red. Sun is a mixture of the two. Fire, moon and sun are the Ichcha, Jnana, Kriya, Shaktis. On the material plane, the white Bindu assumes the form of semen and the red bindu of menstrual fluid. Mahabindu is the state before the manifestation of Prakriti. All three bindus, that is the Kamakala, are Shakti. Though one may indicate predominantly the Shiva, the other the Shakti aspect. Sometimes Mishra bindu is called Shakti Tattva to denote the supremacy of Shakti and sometimes Shiva Tattva to denote the supremacy of the possessor of power or Shaktiman. It is of coupled form. There is no Shiva without Shakti nor Shakti without Shiva. To separate them is as impossible as to separate the moving wind from the steadfast ether in which it blows. In the one Shiva Shakti there is a union, the thrill of which is Nada, whence Mahabindu is born, which itself becomes threefold or three Bindu, which is Kamakala. It is said in the Sharada Tikala that on the bursting or differentiation of the Supreme Bindu, there was unmanifested sound. This unmanifested or Shabda is through action or Kriya Shakti the source of the manifested Shabda and Artha described later. The Brahman as the source of language and ideas on one hand and the objects or Artha they denote on the other is called Shabda Brahman or to use a western term the Logos. From this differentiating Bindu in the form of Prakriti are evolved the Tattvas of mind and matter in all their various forms as also the Lord of the Tattvas, that is, their directing intelligences, Shambhu. The presiding Devata over the Agnya Chakra, the center of mental faculties, and Sada Shiva, Isha, Rudra, Vishnu, Brahma, the Devatas of the five forms of matter. Concluding with Prithvi or Earth in the Muladhara center, wherein the creative Shakti, having finished her work again, rests and is called Kundalini. Just as the atom consists of a static center round which moving forces revolve, so in the human body, Kundalini in the earth chakra is the static center round which she is kinetic aspect as the forces of the body works. 
The whole body as Shakti is in ceaseless movement. Kundalini Shakti is the immobile support of all these operations. When she is aroused and herself moves upwards, she withdraws with and into herself these moving Shaktis and then unites with Shiva in the Sahasrara Lotus. The process upward is the reverse of the involution above described. The worlds are dissolved, or liar, from time to time for all beings. The perfected yogi dissolves the universe for all time for himself. Yoga is thus laya. Before proceeding to a description of the chakras, it is first necessary to describe more fully the constituents of the body, that is, power to manifest as the tattvas mentioned, extending from prakriti to prithvi. It is of these tattvas that the chakras are centers. Secondly, an explanation is required of the doctrine of sound or shabda, which exists in the body in the three inner states of para, pashyanti, madhyama, and is expressed in uttered speech of Vaikhari. This will help the reader to an understanding of the meaning of mantra or manifested Shabda and of the garland of letters which is distributed throughout the six bodily centers.